to talk with you on astrophysics and heliophysics science from the moon. It's, a, it's an invited talk. Thank you, Greg. And did we have a pointer up here as well? Or? That's functioning as the pointer. Okay. Um, thank you very much. It's a, uh, both a pleasure and honor to give this uh, presentation uh, on astrophysics and heliophysics from the moon. And I might actually sneak in some, some other topics along the way as well. Right. Okay, the first question is why even go to the moon to do astrophysics and heliophysics? And there's this very interesting and at times somewhat provocative article by Lester et al. in which they try to assess, and um, this is sort of uh, early last decade, assess what are the arguments for going to the moon? Particularly from the standpoint when you think of things such as the servicing mission 4 of Hubble, what is the point of going first up and then back down into a gravitational potential well? And they lay out uh, a whole slew of arguments uh, why you might think going to the moon is an advantage and then consider the disadvantages. And their argument or their conclusion is that in fact for many aspects of astrophysics, and they were concerned primarily about astrophysics, for many aspects of astrophysics there's in fact not a very compelling reason to do science from the moon. However, there are two key aspects of the moon that I list here. The first, it has no or almost no atmosphere, and the second, it is tidally locked. And one or both of those are, in fact, compelling explanations for going to the surface of the moon for a limited number but very key set of science goals or science topics in the area of astrophysics and heliophysics. What I'm going to try to do, therefore, is lay out for you what some of those key science areas are and then discuss a little bit in the, in the, you know, the second half hour of my talk, discuss a little bit what the technology uh, aspects that we've been developing for those are. The first uh, very compelling aspect that's been highly recognized within astrophysics uh, stems, it's cosmology, but it stems from the most fundamental element or the most simple element in the universe, and that is hydrogen. Now, if you've forgotten all of your quantum mechanics, don't worry. The only thing you need to know about is in that yellow box, Hydrogen is the most simple element, consists only of a proton and electron. They have a property called spin. They are not like little spinning balls, but for the purposes of this talk, you can consider them as such. And those spins can be either aligned or anti-aligned. Now, the ground state, the most energetically favorable state of the atom is if they are anti-aligned, but it can find itself in a state in which they are, are parallel or aligned. Making that transition either emits or absorbs energy, and the radiation that comes out has a wavelength of about 21 centimeters. That's a fundamental aspect of, of um, radio astronomy. It's been well used in a variety of ways to understand both our galaxy and surrounding galaxies. And if we now look at what we think the evolution of the universe has been, this cartoon picture of the universe, on this side is the Big Bang. We're over here. And one of the key aspects of the Big Bang, or, you know, like any actually very fundamental uh, model of the universe, any fundamental theory actually, it can be summarized very simply, and that is in the past the universe was hotter and denser. What that means is if you run the clock backwards, back here the universe was so hot it was a, equivalent to the surface of a star. But if it's hotter and denser in the past, that means in the future it's getting colder and more rarefied. So there's a time at which it started to expand and cool to the point at which neutral hydrogen, which is the most simple, most abundant element, could actually form. And when this happens, this is uh, known as the formation of the cosmic microwave background. There have been Nobel Prizes about that. But I'm not going to talk about that. The key thing is after that happens, then you now have a universe that's filled almost uniformly with neutral hydrogen. And now you, you should be thinking, of course, of this 21 centimeter line. And the key question is, if you look at us today, most of the universe is not neutral. That may come as a bit of a surprise because we, as our, you know, we ourselves are neutral, but if you just think about the solar system, 99% or more of the mass is in the sun. The sun is essentially a big ball of ionized gas. So most of the, most of the hydrogen gas, most of the, the universe today is ionized. Somehow, it made this transition from a largely neutral state to a largely ionized state. And key aspects in uh, astrophysics recognized by the, the recent astrophysics decadal survey or astronomy decadal survey is understanding that transi transition from a largely neutral to a largely ionized state. And of course, since I've been talking about hydrogen so much, you can probably guess that this 21 centimeter line may be a way to probe that. And the cartoon picture is that you go from a largely neutral state, and we now, in fact, uh, from a variety of different observations, we have indi indications that at about a billion years after the Big Bang, 
There are now stars, in fact, something like infant galaxies forming that we can actually detect. So somewhere around a billion years, uh, within the first billion years of the, gal of the universe's history is, is you go from this largely neutral uniform state to the beginning of a very structured and, and ionized state. Uh, and the theorists tell us very confidently, because in fact theorists are never in doubt, that there should be three, three in fact, three different hydrogen signals that should appear. The first is actually a, a signal from when there were no stars. So I mean, just appreciate there is a potential way to see or to track the evolution of the universe before there are any luminous objects. And I won't go to the details, but the theorists quite confidently tell us, you know, this signal has to be there. It has to be exactly that shape, that amplitude. Otherwise, there's something fundamentally we do not understand about the universe. Uh, once the first stars turn on, then their, their ultraviolet light couples to this 21 centimeter radiation. It's interesting quantum mechanics. I won't go into it. But essentially, you go from, you now have this very sharp trough. And then finally, as the gas is heated up in the final stages, just before it ionizes, you now have actually a, uh, an emission peak. And the key question then is, if you really think that astronomy is an observational science, this is the theorist prediction. And the key goal then over the next decade or next couple of decades is to actually assess, is this in fact what happens in the universe? And one of the compelling at, uh, reasons to go to the moon now is, if we move forward, oh, one other aspect I should point out, this 21 centimeter line, uh, the 21 centimeter line is what happens when the, gas, or when the, the hydrogen atoms are emitting back in here. So it, they, they emit at 21 centimeter lines. But in the process, the universe has expanded. So we do not see that radiation at 21 centimeters today. The universe has expanded, so it actually comes out, you know, the relevant rate wavelengths that you should be thinking about are sort of something of order of three meters, so comparable, in, you know, perhaps in scale to the, the size of the ceiling. Okay, the reason that, one of the compelling reasons of going to the moon, and this exploits the fact that it is totally locked, is this top panel shows the, freak, the spectrum allocation in the United States, and it's somewhat similar in other nations. Uh, all of the parts in yellow are reserved for radio astronomy. So you can immediately see some of the problem. And this is the part of the spectrum that we'd like to exploit to see this red-shifted 21 centimeter signal. So we have this intense blast from all these other transmitters. And, and even, you know, this, this does not operate at the relevant frequencies. But even things like this are immensely stronger than the typical radiation signal that we're attempting to detect. And this plot down here comes from Radio Astronomer Explorer, which was flown in the um, early 70s. And it illustrates a very simple fact that if you put a few thousand kilometers of rock between you and radio transmitters, you can't detect the radio transmitters. And you're now free to observe uh, this fundamental aspects of the universe. And in fact, the far side of the moon, the, the area over the far side, of, actually the far side itself as well as the area of the far side, is in some sense an internationally recognized nature preserve. It is recognized by the International Telecommunications Union as this special area from which one can do very fundamental radio astronomy, perhaps in a way that's possible no, nowhere else in the inner solar system. Oh, and it was also, this, uh, this effect was well known in the Apollo era. They had a term for it, uh, loss of signal or LOS. Uh, when the command module went behind the moon, they had LOS. Switching gears and now moving much closer to home, uh, the sun also emits at radio wavelengths. This is a white light picture or a white light movie of the sun. And what you see here uh, occasionally are these very large blasts of, of plasma coming off the, the surface or the outer, re outer atmosphere of the sun. And the, these coronal mass ejections are a combination, well, they're magnetized plasma moving out into the inner solar system or out into the solar system. These are interesting from the standpoint of, of understanding how the inner, how the heat is transferred from the surface of the sun out to the outer corona and beyond. Um, fundamental aspects of particle acceleration, how do you actually accelerate particles? And these things I'm not showing you, but they do generate radio emission. But this is also, you know, if people ever ask you, well, how is what you're doing socially relevant or useful? This is the kind of stuff that has, can have direct impact on our lives. Uh, one specific example is the Quebec power system, the Quebec power grid failed in 1989 when one of these coronal mass ejections, it, it hit the Earth, it hit the Earth's magnetosphere, the magnetic fields lined up just right, and it induced huge currents and essentially shut down part of, of Quebec's power grid. There's an even more powerful one 
in sort of the mid 1800s that uh, at the time, of course, all we had were telegraph systems, but it's, it set telegraph stations on fire. And I think we simply do not yet appreciate in a, in a, a, a society or a civilization that makes use of space assets the kind of, you know, the range of behaviors that the sun can exhibit. And then finally, of course, if you're seriously thinking of sending astronauts out into the inner solar system, you know, this kind of stuff can, can be damaging to their health. So you want to understand from, part, from fundamental physics standpoints all the way to aspects of exploration, what is the interaction of the sun with, say, the local, inter, local interplanetary medium? And actually, I will show you, here is, uh, here's a plot now of um, some, of the in, some of the kind of data. I think these are acquired, yeah, these are acquired from the wind waves uh, experiment, but there's, a, there's an analogous experiment on stereo. Uh, this is an illustration of the kind of uh, uh, data that are acquired. Here is, on this axis is time, this axis is frequency, the brightness is logarithmic, so where it's red, it's very strong, and you see this whole rich phenomenology. I don't have time to get into it, but it involves essentially radio uh, acceleration of particles and electron beams and producing uh, radio emission. But from that, you can tr effectively trace how these uh, shocks are moving into the inner solar system and potentially as well uh, track or understand the magnetic fields, which is one of the key parts of understanding how they then couple to the Earth's magnetosphere. Um, but this is all essentially single dipole. This is not an image. This is just uh, inferring what is happening. And what you'd really like are images, even if only crude images, of what is happening near the surface of the sun. And for here, here for an illustration, here is one of those earlier coronal mass ejections. These red or orange lines are, are putative magnetic field lines. Here's perhaps the shock front. And we don't understand even very basic things. For instance, it, are the particles being accelerated? Is most of the action happening out here on the front of the shock or on the sides or perhaps even in the tail where the magnetic fields come back together? So these are very fundamental things that you can't answer. And even very crude images, something, you know, can we, uh, these are supposed to represent sort of resolution elements, these yellow circles. Is the, is the particle acceleration happening here or here? are things that we, we can't even address, but we, for which we need some kind of imaging instrument or imaging uh, capability. Uh, and then finally, very briefly, I'll also point out, and this is sort of now crossing the boundary, you know, between our silos of uh, astrophysics, heliophysics, and planetary science, but the, the planets in our own solar system emit radio radiation. I didn't say it about heliophysics, but I'll, I'll make the point here. This is, again, time. This is um, frequency. The frequency axis here goes from about 0.1 to 10 megahertz, and the key aspect there is that the Earth's atmosphere is opaque at those frequencies. You can't see much of this radiation from the ground. In this particular case, this is uh, the Cassini spacecraft that was observing Jupiter during its true space. As I indicated earlier, those were wind and stereo data. Those are spaceborne instruments because the Earth's atmosphere is simply opaque. You have to go to space to do these kind of, of observations. And again, it's very much the same. Uh, time frequency in the color scheme is indicating brightness or intensity. Red is very bright. The key point here I'm making only is that Jupiter is a, a radio emitter. In fact, all of the gas giants and the Earth produce a similar kind of emission. Uh, and there's this, this picture, if you can see it at the bottom, that is illustrating what happens. You have accelerated electrons that impact the, the upper magnetic or the magnetic poles of the, of the planets. The reason this is also of interest to a, uh, astrophysics is that you can then ask the question, this happens in our own solar system. We now know of extrasolar planets. Can we detect and study extrasolar planets using the same mechanism? In fact, the first suggestions I found in the literature date back to 1977, and I thought it was an amazing jump from the fact that at that time, we only knew of Jupiter, Saturn, and the Earth that emitted this kind of radio radiation. And people are already starting to think, hey, can we detect other planets this way? Also point out in the same vein, that you could ask the question about once you find extrasolar planets, most of the extrasolar planets that we know today, and indeed, I, I should point out, if you're not an astrophysicist, or you, you know, this is something even astrophysicists or astronomers sometimes, I think, gloss over this. We're but most of those planets of Jupiter-like planets will, I think, hesitate to use the word holy grail, but certainly one of the targets is, can we find something like this? a habitable world, a blue marble city in space. Now this picture, which is of course taken from, from lunar orbit, is quite nice, but in fact, 
Here is how the Earth looks from the, the edge of our own solar system. And this yellow stripe here is, in fact, uh, imperfections in the camera optics. The Earth itself is that little you know, white dot, and you would be forgiven for overlooking it. But one of the questions is, you know, trying to find something like that, even against a nearby star, is tough. And there have been some concepts for how you might sight on the surface of the moon or at least near, uh, near lunar environment some kind of uh, camera or some kind of instrument that would then look at the Earth and use that as a way to understand how we might someday uh, study extrasolar planets in the nearby solar neighborhood. Uh, and these go by, there's certainly a, a so-called camera for lunar observations of the variable Earth concept. And I think it's essentially the same concept, the Lunar Observatory for Unresolved Polarimetry of the Earth. And there's a poster by Bill Sparks et al. Uh, laying out some of these concepts here today or here this week. Uh, but focusing on the radio uh, astronomy aspects of it, and certainly from the standpoint of going to the surface of the, of the Earth, or the surface of the Moon, um, this is in some sense a roadmap of there's a long-term goal for us, which is to get to the far side, to access that, if you will, internationally recognized hab uh, resource or, or natural preserve on the far side. But getting there may take several steps. And the goal is to do science on every step of the way with a gradually increasing capability and complexity. And what I'd like to do is very briefly just walk you through notionally how that, how that might work. The first is, in fact, remember I've said not only the far side, but the, the area over the far side. You don't actually have to be on the surface. And you've perhaps heard of this concept before, the Dark Ages Radio Explorer. This is a lunar orbiter that was proposed last year. Um, if you can see it, the, the concept is down here for a spacecraft. Most of the science instrument that you can see are largely just those gold cones. But here's this same figure that I showed before, the, the, um, the, this particular shape of the hydrogen uh, emission or hydrogen line. And this red area is, in fact, the portion of it that is, that is uh, the focus of the DARE experiment. It is not the entire range of hydrogen signal that's a balance between what we think we can do in space versus what perhaps might better be done on the ground coupled with keeping the mission lifetime reasonable or, or in some sense affordable. But the key point is the DARE window co covers, at least according to what the theorists predict, this crucial time when the first stars are tar starting to turn on. So it is addressing some very key astrophysics in, in a very small package and it's for uh, doing only a lunar orbiter. The next perhaps uh, most complicated case would be actually putting an antenna on the surface of the moon, and these might actually be able to move in parallel. Here you can see the antenna concept that we've been pursuing. This is polymid film. Uh, if you're at all familiar with the spacecraft business, you often know if this is Kapton. In this particular case, this is Kapton with some metal on it. Uh, and this particular, it's also shown deployed in a not particularly analogous lunar environment. But the interesting aspect of this, when we did this experiment, these are some of the data that resulted. And those, at least in front, should be able to see that there appears to be a dip in power uh, during a portion of the, the time that we were observing. This is a full day. And that dip in power is exactly what, we, what you would expect is if you're getting absorption from the Earth's ionosphere. Now, we've since transitioned the experiment to something more closely approximating a lunar environment. Um, out here in the, this is shown in the desert of New Mexico. And those data are still under um, analysis, are still under process. But I will leave you with the teaser that, of course, by looking at the uh, Earth's ionospheric absorption, we've heard a lot about the lunar exosphere here today, and we'll hear more. There is, in fact, the lunar exosphere is largely ionized. So you should expect a similar kind of signal, a similar kind of absorption from the lunar ionosphere, lunar exosphere. And this would be, an, in, if you will, an in situ, potentially long-term way of monitoring what is happening. What is the response of the lunar exosphere to, uh, say, pumping by the solar, uh, solar radiation or potentially any outgassing that's still occurring? Uh, and in fact, okay, I just said uh, most of what's on this slide. Uh, and in fact, we've seen this, this kind of picture before. But even a very simple uh, antenna, potentially on the near side, or doesn't have to be on the far side to do this kind of lunar science, uh, could be a, a very powerful way complementing some, of, complementing, complementing some of the probes that we heard about, and I suspect we'll hear about momentarily. Um, and uh, the other aspect of this is that by laying out such simple things as radio antennas, my understanding is there are some aspects of, of 
charging on the cables that the Apollo astronauts laid out. So this is also, some, in some sense, it may be relevant for exploration. Uh, the other thing is, of course, if you can get a, a dipole to the far side of the moon, and Jack Burns will describe a mission concept for doing that, I think, Thursday, uh, then you can start talking about either taking DARE science the next step of going deeper on the same frequency range or potentially going even deeper in redshift or lower in frequency, which then is starting to probe very interesting cosmology. And this, this window uh, here in red is intentionally somewhat fuzzy to indicate that that, that kind of experiment may be a follow-on to DARE, or probably is a follow-on to the DARE concept. But the notion is by going to the far side, even with very simple uh, antenna concepts or very simple instrument packages, you might still be able to do very fundamental cosmology and astrophysics. How would you lay out one of these things? There are actually multiple approaches that our team is investigating. Uh, this particular uh, example you see is being here it's being tested in the JPL Mars yard. Uh, the, I suppose, technical term is inflatable. I think you can all see why we often call it a party favor. Uh, but here it is being deployed across the surface of the, um, the, uh, and the Mars yard. And the idea here of what I've described to the, the engineers is, look, what we all, all we want is a little box. You flip a switch, the antenna goes out. Very simple, low risk, uh, but capable of making very interesting measurements, even if it's, you know, regardless of whether it's on the near or the far side. Um, Oh, and the other, the other comment I'll make is that, you know, you saw uh, one of the engineers in the, in, the, um, in the beginning, and very often these are, these are phrased as, is this a robotic versus human mission? And, and I think that's just, that must be something in human nature, right? It's easier to say Coke versus Pepsi or taste great, less filling, or robotic versus human. I think what we should really be thinking about is more like how do robotics and humans interact and reinforce each other's strengths. There are things that, that robots simply can't do that we can do. And they're the things that, you know, frankly, it's a waste of our time to be doing. That's, you know, that's why we have computers, right? To make ourselves more productive. Uh, at Goddard, um, in a moment, we shall, I hope, see. Yeah, uh, at Goddard, a comparable uh, technology. Again, very, the idea is to keep it very simple. You bolt it onto, say, the side of a lander. Uh, this is more a javelin or a spring-loaded concept, and similar concepts have been explored in Europe. Uh, here you see uh, one of the test setups, very you know, little box, and then when you're on the surface, the, um, the box opens up, it shoots something out, and then pulls out the, the film. And uh, I believe, yeah, what you'll see here in a second, here's this javelin, and I hope you saw it, it just went shooting out. Uh, under, in some sense, robotic control from the astronaut at the, at the lander. And then if we, the next, the next uh, video, when I get it to work here, will actually show the first um, meter, yeah, the first meter or so of the, of the uh, film actually starting to be pulled out. And, and uh, I, in the interest of time, will not show, but there's additional video of it actually creeping across the surface of the ground. Uh, I think we've heard a little bit of discussion already, but of course many of you are aware the Europeans have a concept for so-called European lunar lander that would be targeted for the South Pole. Its prime mission is, as I understand it, technology, namely precision landing, but they are, they are quite aware that you can do science if you, bring, if you bring along the appropriate instrumentation. And one of the responses to the recent ESA call for uh, declarations of interest was a so-called lunar radio explorer, which would be part of a larger package. You can see here the concept uh, being led by a Dutch team of a little deployable boom with a tripole antenna that would be able to do various kinds of sensing, probably more along the lines of the lunar ionosphere that I described earlier, or maybe some, some all-sky measurements um, given the location. Uh, then looking ahead, once you've proven the technology, you can start thinking about things such as uh, an array on the near side, perhaps of order 100 antennas designed to do the solar imaging, both from the standpoint, again, of fundamental uh, astronomy, fundamental physics, uh, as well as some aspects of, say, societal protection or, or astronaut protection, where you actually have of order 100 uh, antennas imprinted or somehow deposited on this polymid film and then deployed. In this particular concept, or in the, the original concept, we had three arms. You can see one coming toward you, and then off in the distance there are these other two with a central equipment package. Some of the technology that we're developing now I'm lead, is leading me to at least think about we might be able to do slightly more complex deployments uh, at not, you know, not much additional, compl 
that essentially more complex deployments without very little additional cost uh, and actually increase the capability substantially. And then the final, the final goal, of course, from the astronomy standpoint is not just to make single dipole measurements, but actually to do imaging uh, of the, the cosmic dawn of the dark ages when the first stars were forming. That, uh, that undoubtedly will require an array of dipoles on the far side. But again, the idea is to work toward that capability doing science every step of the way and increasing complexity. Uh, I think I've said much of this. This is just that roadmap again uh, to imprint it in your minds. And uh, I think I'll, this is my closing slide. I'll just leave you with, I hope I've convinced you that there is a compelling science case spanning much of uh, astronomy, many of the key questions in astronomy and, and heliophysics. There's ongoing technology to, uh, development that may also be relevant to various aspects of lunar science and exploration, and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Are there, are there any? Rich. On the last chart with the, uh, from the Big Bang to today, where does JWST focus? And, uh, uh, um, to make sure everybody heard it, the question was, and I'm not sure, I think it's disappeared. Yeah, okay. Um, the JWST, um, let's see, so that I don't blind Greg. Um, JWST would extend, actually Hubble is already extending out somewhere to this region. Uh, it, the actual extent of JWST in part depends somewhat upon what you believe about the first stars. But somewhere out sort of into this region is kind of what people are talking about for JWST. And of course, uh, one of the attractions of the 21 centimeter line is you can go before the first stars. Time for one more question, if there's any out there. Joe, here, why don't you... Uh, he often talks a lot about mouth, but... <laughs> he might, yeah. This isn't a very serious question, but we were just sitting here talking, why Quebec? Why did Quebec have this problem and no one else? In terms of, uh, you said it, it said it affected the, the, the uh, power array there. Not, okay, the question was uh, the Quebec power grid. I don't know the details. I'm sure it has, um, you know, you could always potentially mitigate this kind of stuff perhaps with better designs on the ground or something. But, okay, I guess Rich can, can answer this question for yeah, us. See, I'm, I'm sitting with someone here from Quebec, and she's like, ah, why, yeah. why is that? Uh, so. Uh, the reason is because the uh, power uh, grid failure created loose voltages, and during a large uh, event like they had at that time, the Aurora Oval moved southward and was right over Quebec, so there was large differences in their, essentially the grounding of the system due to the electric fields due to the Aurora Oval. And also in Quebec, uh, their grounding is in the... Uh, uh, bedrock, if you like, uh, so that uh, the induced voltage is more effective in that region. I think that's the key thing of why you say why Quebec versus Ontario. Yeah. There may be differences in, in how you actually implement this grounding. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's give Joe another hand. Thank you.